Welcome to tonight's lecture on the environment and our health. <clears throat> our next seminar between me, Dr. Jeff, and Dr. Tent is going to be our roundtable. We're going to talk about patient cases. We're going to bring a bunch of patient cases to your attention to show you what we can do for your health. Don't forget we do virtual appointments, so you can uh, do appointments online with us. Don't forget to look us up on Facebook. Share, uh, subscribe to YouTube, our YouTube page for Diverse Health Services. Look for our protocols as well. And you can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And Instagram is fantastic. If you go to Instagram and go to Diverse Health Services, you will see all of our videos, all of our patient testimonials. It's a great learning curve for many. You can find us on Rumble, TikTok, and Gab. <clears throat> Don't forget to share your testimonials with us. Daily, we do testimonials from patients. We make videos, we put them on the Instagram. You're going to learn a lot of things about what we can treat for people and what we can do for your health. I'd be remiss not to mention this guy here. This is Harry Eidner, good friend of mine. He was our nutrition rep from Biotics. I have nothing but good things to say about him. He always had a positive personality. He was always fun to be with. Just a great guy. We lost him recently. That's for you, Harry. All right, let's get started. The environment, how has it changed? Our environment has changed drastically. Years ago, when you used to think about the environment and your food that you eat, the chemicals in the air or whatever, what was out there, basically, if you took some nutrition, it was like a light switch. You take some nutrition, you'd flick that switch, you were better, you'd go about your way. In today's world, it's not that easy. Taking, a, taking some nutrition is something you have to do on a regularity or a regular basis. Just flicking that switch to be better isn't going to happen. Our environment has changed so drastically, it has affected our health in such a way that now we have to do more maintenance with the nutrition. Years ago, you would find this nutrition in food and you never had to worry about it. You ate healthy food, you were healthy. Today's world, the food's not healthy. In this seminar tonight, I'm gonna to show you some things that I think will wake you up to what has happened to our environment. Now, there's people out there that think that gas, a cow burping or gas from a cow, the methane gas is gonna destroy our environment. I don't think that's the truth. I think you're gonna find in this seminar we shouldn't be worried so much about a cow or animals, if they burp or belch or fart or whatever it might be. I don't think that's going to destroy our environment. I think there's other things we should be looking at. And for all those people out there, the vegans that are more concerned about the treatment of animals than their health, consider this when you're eating your plant-based foods. Consider how many snakes, microorganisms, frogs, mice, moles, voles, and worms that are killed in the process of tilling the soils to prepare that plant for the things you eat. In one episode of Yellow Sony he said, how cute does the animal have to be before we decide it's okay to eat the animal? Bill Gates, the philanthropist, COVID-19 pandemic expert, and a man who has spent billions of dollars on the environment through Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation wants Americans to go 100% synthetic beef. He says this could help save the environment. In other words, get rid of the cows, let's go to a synthetic beef. And while you're eating your mushy meat, because what his plan is, he, ha he owns Memphis Meats, their plan is to take a stem cell and a, stel and a cell from that cow and grow a steak or grow a hamburger. Can you imagine that mushy mess that'll be and how nutritionally devoid that would be? And while you're eating your mushy synthetic steak, you're going to get your shot one way or another. U.S. meat supplies may soon be contaminated with mRNA proteins by, from biotech vaccines. Pfizer, Bayer, and other large pharmaceutical companies have already announced mRNA vaccines in the meats. They have been creating the vaccines since 2016. Merely handling red meat containing the mRNA products will be equivalent to being exposed to shedding from a virus recipient. Bill Gates, the bioterrorist. Step one, put farmers out of business. Step two, buy cheap farmland. He's the second main uh, land owner in the United States besides the Chinese. Step three, claim to be the savior. Bill Gates is the most dangerous man on the planet, I feel, right now. 
Electric vehicles, what are they doing to the environment? And how are they affecting us? Are they dangerous? Are they good for the environment? Here's a sign that says, due to a safety recall involving the batteries from the Chevy Volt, the EVs and the EUVs are prohibited from parking at this facilities until further notice. That's due to the fires that they have from those vehicles. Now, by the way, just to give you some information on that, I was out with a friend of mine, Timo Steimer, who is a CEO of a big company. He said, by the way, did you know on that Chevy Bolt that the battery on that, if it goes bad, is $32,000 to replace? I said, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, moving forward. This is our future, my environmental sustainable future. This is already in the works. They've already got the contract signed. It's uh, going to start in 2024. Uh, those who stand off to the left that think the electric cars are better for the environment, I want you to listen closely to this. We're on the verge of destroying our last known ecosystem on the Earth. Now, 70% of the planet is ocean, 90% is deep seas. Sources of rare earth minerals for electric devi electronic devices, specifically electric cars and cell phones, and scientists are looking for these polymetabolic metallic, polymetallic rocks, potato-like. These are rocks that sit on the ocean floor and they basically contain all the rare earth minerals that they're looking for to make these batteries for cars. Now, certain things in the ocean attach to these things. Octopuses attach to these little rocks. Um, they lay their eggs on these rocks. Other uh, species will attach these rocks so that they can avoid ocean currents from moving them around. <clears throat> There's no research to date done, basically, on what's going to happen when we start mining these rocks. This is one of the machines that they'll use here. So deep sea mining stirs up lead, mercury, cadmium, cobalt, copper, nickel for a few hundred miles from the site. Decades to centuries for animal life, decades to centuries for animal life, animal life sea creatures to return to what, uh, which creates a different ecosystem. So it's going to take years for these ecosystems to return. Deep sea mining operations of rare earth minerals will be catastrophic for our oceans. The metals, gems, and minerals that miners are trying to access are not only inherently valuable, but they're also needed to continue producing things like smartphones and electric cars, both of which require rare earth minerals. Ships will draw thousands of pounds of this sediment through a hose to the surface, remove the metallic objects, known as polymetallic nodules, and then flush the rest back into the ocean. It's going to create a stirring up of all these rare earth minerals and other contaminants. You thought that Flint, Michigan was bad with the lead. Imagine what this is going to do. Or imagine with mercury, the amount of mercury that will be in your oceans, the fish will ingest, and other things. Imagine swimming in these oceans after we stir all this up. And it's not just going to be something local. Remember, Chernobyl and some of those other incidences that occurred, our waterways around the world are already contaminated. Imagine when we start doing this deep sea mining. Some of that slurry will contain toxins such as mercury, lead, which could poison the surrounding ocean for hundreds of miles. This is just to make the battery to make these cars run. Deposits. Early investigations of the seafloor in the 1960s and 70s revealed that the nodules are clustered in certain areas of the seafloor. Their locations depend highly on environmental factors, needing high oxygenation levels and a source of metal in the seawater or seabed to grow. Similar to how iron in steel reacts with oxygen and water to create a layer of rust, nodules are formed in layers of oxidized metal. For a nodule to form, a piece of debris has to sink into the oxygen-rich environment of the deep sea floor. From above, free-flowing iron and manganese ions dissolved in water react with the oxygen and form layers. These form nodules at the surface of the sea floor. From below, the metals get pushed up by concentration gradients through the pore sediment. And once they reach the oxygen-rich environment, they react and start forming nodules 10 to 15 centimeters below the surface. 
depending on their depth, different percentages of metal will be present. While the majority of the metals in the nodules are manganese and iron, surface nodules are exposed to more cobalt, while deeper nodules collect more lithium and nickel. These layers form at astonishingly low rates, around 1 to 10 millimeters per million years. In the time it took our ancestors to spread out from Africa and dominate the world, these nodules only grew the width of a human hair. Mining operations have the potential to wipe out species we haven't even begun to study. Sea sponges use the nodules as anchor points, deep sea octopus use them to lay and protect their eggs. And with these nodules taking millions of years to form, any surviving members of the species that depend on them would be left without a home, devastating an entire ecosystem which we have very little knowledge about, or its impact on the rest of the water column ecosystem. One of the few studies on the impact of these operations was conducted in the late 80s by a German government-funded research expedition off the coast of Peru. To assess the effects of nodule collection, they carved out trenches and removed nodules from an area two nautical miles in diameter. The first seabed disturbances were created in 1989, and after 33 years, the seabed floor has not recovered. The track can still be seen to this day. 33 years, the seabed has not recovered. That's how long it took for that to recover. 33 years, it still hasn't recovered. Now, all this destruction to the last ecosystem that we have on Earth not touched, and we're going to start touching it. And here's the thing. We will be less than 50% electric vehicles on the road by year 2050 across the board, or across the world, around the world. At 50%, we will, we will have only a two degree decrease in Celsius or two degree Celsius reduction in global temperature. I ask you, is this really enough change for the impact it will have on our health? CO2 emissions, talking about electric cars, there's no doubt side by side to a combustion car that the electric cars will emit less emissions or CO2. But in the development of these cars and in the waste product they'll produce when we have to get rid of what's left over these cars when they're finally done being used is more detrimental than any combustion car. There's double the CO2 emissions in the preparation or the development of these electric cars over a combustion car. Is that really worth it? I'm not sure. So what do some of these things do that we're going to stir up in the ocean to our health? Well, cadmium has high blood pressure, kidney dysfunction, arterial plaque, prostate swelling, prostate cancer, anemia, emphysema, fatigue, neuropathy, and pulmonary fibrosis. Cobalt, hearing loss, vision loss, cardiovascular defects, endocrine defects, cognitive decline, weakness, and fatigue. Mercury, this is the people that are stuck. They look like they're just staring off into space and their bodies don't move. Physiological trauma, visual damage, kidney damage, inflammation and mouth bleeding, migraines, loss of motor skills, GI dysfunction, blood pressure troubles, anorexia, anemia, and autoimmune disease. Copper, headaches, fevers, passing out, vomiting, diarrhea, black stools, abdominal cramps, visual problems. This is all part of what we're going to be stirring up in our oceans. Uh, frontal headaches with nickel. Insomnia, nausea, vertigo, contact dermatitis, lung burns, and lung cancer. Lead, colic, damage to the gums, gout, anemia, seizures, uh, metal, dam or met metal damage, blood pressure troubles, muscle weakness, neurological problems, tremors, behavioral issues, and kidney damage. Now, what are the consequences of these precious metals to our health? Those are some of them that I mentioned with each individual one, but overall, look at the consequences. Premature death, inflamed airways, allergy sensitivity, sea life has difficulty forming shells due to lack of oxygen, acid rain, shallow water acidification, dark ice sheets causing them to go from bright reflections of light to dark causing the overall ocean temperatures to rise. Isn't that actually what we're trying to prevent? 
Aren't we trying to prevent the, the oceans from warming up so that those polar caps don't try to melt? I think that's what we're doing. Since batteries are more harmful than combustion motors in the production and overall disposal of them, why don't we look into other fuels? That would be my idea. What about methane? What about ammonia? What about hydrogen? Hydrogen, the byproduct or, the, or the, the, the product left over after you have a hydrogen motor, is water. I think we need to look for alternative fuels, not go into these battery cars. So heavy metal testing at our office for people that get exposed to heavy metals. Basically what we do is we run different tests. We have hair mineral analysis and we have urine. My preference is urine. What I typically do is use this guy right here called porphyzyme to release the metals from the tissue. When you're checking heavy metals, whether it be hair analysis or urine, you have to release the metals. Many times you'll do these tests and they won't show heavy metals. That's because you're not, you did not release the metals from the tissue. So using porphyzyme will help to release those metals and then you do the testing about three days later. That way, if there's no metals when you do the testing after using porphyzyme, you know for sure you don't have any metals in the body. Other things we use are NAC, osteo-B, selenium methionine, zinc, LPA, and TRS spray to get these models or, or metals or leach, leach these metals from the human body. Here's a question. Once we, if we can, perfect these electric vehicles, will all the wealthy people or the elite ground their private jets? Taking a private jet coast to coast has a bigger carbon footprint than one person can possibly give to the earth in a lifetime. So I ask you, are these people here going to park their jets? Imagine this, imagine if you will, these people flying around in a private jet only to land on the ground and then get into an electric car. Well, that's hypocritical. Maybe an oxymoron if you look at it this way. Conservative in the sky, liberal on the ground. But these are some of the people that all have Lear jets. For Pete's sakes, I think it's John Travolta, this house is basically looks like an airport. And imagine, my question is this. Why, if we're going to drive an electric car, are we going to stop these planes from flying because of the carbon footprint they put on the earth? Think of this. If we're flying around in these planes driving electric cars, what's the difference? What are we really fixing there? Then we have this, something I didn't know about, bunker fuels. The shipping industry main source of fuel. This fuel is very thick, bottom of the refining process, therefore it is thick, needs to be heated to put into the tank and also heat it to go into the motor. Spills have a sustainable environmental impact. They're hard to recover and they're very toxic. So imagine if we start stirring up the bottom of the oceans, mining for all of these polymetallic rocks to get the cadmium, get the nickel and the other things needed for the, bur the batteries. Imagine what we're gonna do. This stuff sinks to the bottom of the ocean and it's thick and it's murky and it's toxic. Can you imagine the size of the battery it would take to run a cruise ship? Honestly. A single cruise ship is responsible for 83,000 cars worth of CO2. Now, I'm not trying to pick on the cruise lines, but this is the bunker fuel, and this is what it does. This is what it produces. 421,000 cars uh, worth of nitric oxide, a million cars worth of particle uh, emissions, 376 million cars worth of sulfur dioxide. The top 49 cruise ships produce the same sulfur content as 18 million vehicles. Thought this was interesting. Australian Bank begins linking customers' transactions to carbon footprints. A new feature that links purchases to a customer's carbon footprint and warns them when they are going over the average. The bank gives the customer an option to pay a fee to offset the carbon footprint. Carbon units would be deducted from the personal budget with every payment of the of transport fuel, home heating fuels, and electricity bills. And anyone going over the limit would be forced to purchase additional units in the personal carbon market from those with excess to sell. To me, <clears throat> this is another way for the bank to make more money. Basically, you're gonna be scared into watching your carbon footprint, but how many people will really watch it and where, who makes the money? looks like the banks will make the money. Now, 
face masks and other equipment meant to protect us from coronavirus are polluting our oceans. <clears throat> One beach about 100 meters long was found 70 masks and that's on the uninhabited island in the middle of nowhere. Another side effect of the coronavirus, pollution. More people are relying on single-use plastics, things like masks, gloves, and bottles of hand sanitizer, and they're ending up in the ocean. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber reports from Boca Raton. All right, Tony, bump it back. Keep coming. Just off the coast of Boca Raton, Alex Schultz is about to lead a different kind of pandemic recovery. I think I see a bottle up in there. Target acquired. We'll just cruise this rip. There's going to be all sorts of plastic in it. Since 2017, his company, 4Ocean, has pulled over 10 million pounds of trash from oceans and waterways. From water bottles to tires to grocery bags. But today, the trash they're finding is different. Face masks, we've been finding a lot of these lately in our coastal waters. Across the globe, an estimated 129 billion disposable face masks and 64 billion disposable gloves are now used every month, according to a study in environmental science and technology. And four ocean cleaning crews say they're finding it in the ocean by the thousands. It's, it's everywhere. It's Bali. It's Guatemala. It's Haiti. Masks are required all around the world, and, and people are using these single-use masks. They're coming out of these stores, they're getting to their car, and they're taking off the gloves, they're taking off the mask, and they're tossing them into these parking lots. And all these drains are leading to the oceans. COVID-19 is forcing all of us to change our behaviors in big, often necessary ways. But with all of the gloves, disposable food containers, and face masks, experts say all of this could get much worse, threatening marine ecosystems, harming marine life, and even contaminating our food supply. Every single year, plastic producers are manufacturing more and more plastic to meet the demand of consumers. And if we are not able to change our consumption habits, then the amount of plastic is gonna to continue to skyrocket. Got him? And at a time when we all feel the weight of the world on our shoulders, a person determined to save the oceans is asking for progress, not perfection. So 1.6 billion disposable masks enter our oceans in 2020. Just because they are labeled disposable does not mean that they are gone. It can take 450 years to biodegrade our disposable face masks. So to fix ourselves, we destroyed the earth. Now, Germany announces plans to use these masks, 800 million to be exact, at the cost of $5.9 billion. They're going to burn these masks for heat. Now, why? Well, the smoke from it, the smoke and ash they leave behind will produce similar pollution that, uh, to that of fossil fuels. Why are they burning this is what I asked. So I talked to another friend of mine, team, or I talked to Timo again. Timo's from Germany, he's 100% Germany, he's here on a green card to work. He said, well, let's put it this way. My mom's heating bill went from $82 a month to $650 a month. I said, you have to be kidding me. Why did it go from that price to that price? Here's the answer on that. <clears throat> they basically buy their oil from Russia. So the prices went from $82 a month to heat her house to $650. So one of their ideas to counteract that is to do this which is going to put more ash, more pollution into the environment. Okay, can a virus be a pathological bioweapon? Since we are mentioning face masks, let's look at that. Can a virus be a pathological, <clears throat> pathological bioweapon? Well, let's look. Here's the blood work of a patient. This is a CD4, CD8, and if you look at this, this is immune suppression. So the viruses out there can create immune suppression. This is what you'd see similar on an AIDS patient. So basically what this virus that this person got has suppressed his immune system to the point of making his blood look like an AIDS patient. It's immune compromise and it's long standing. Strange things are happening everywhere in this environment. This guy's wearing a shirt. He says, I cannot tell my kids I did nothing. Myocarditis and 
in uh, U.S. ages 12 to 20, 19 in 2019-2020, uh, or 20, were four, and then in 2021, it was 2,236. That's kind of interesting. What's happening out there? Let's look at more. Mysterious heart attacks, mysterious strokes, mysterious cardiac arrests in children, mysterious teens dying suddenly and unexpectedly in their sleeps, mysterious athletes dropping on, uh, dead on the playing field, high school football, mysteri mysterious facial paralysis, mysterious children with hepatitis. It's all just a mystery. I can't figure out what is going on. Medical emergencies. Hunter Brown, a member of the U.S. Air Force Academy football team, was walking back to his dorm and dropped dead at 21 years old. Now remember this, why are young, fine-tuned athletes dropping in every sport from heart-related issues? Is that environmental? I don't know, but these kids are dropping all over the place. It seems very strange. Here's another medical emergency. So for them, this is about a thousand days too late. Her. Now, Nariman, I looking at uh, after the, to the the day, families are pushing feds to pushing the feds to. Sorry, Nariman, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm not feeling very well right now, and I'm about to. Uh, okay, we'll come back to and, me right now, and we'll make sure that Jessica, you are doing okay. Did you see her gait at the end when she started to, in my book, looking at that, you're watching a, either a clot forming in her brain or going through her brain. Her D-dimer was probably through the roof. Her fibrinogen was probably high. But in my book, that's what a clot looks like going through the brain. Become a well-rounded athlete. I've said this for a long time. For all the athletes out there, what you want to do at DHS, this is what we can do for you. I would not put my kid on the field in today's world if I didn't do this. There's too much risk out there now. One of our, <clears throat> one of our office girls, her husband, when we ran the echocardiogram, she had no clue. He had a bundle branch block. I'm going to call her out, Jordan, or Jordan. Is that true, Lauren? Just give me the yes. She give me the yes over there. Her husband had no idea, played hockey. We did an echocardiogram on him. He had a bundle branch block that he didn't know about. Now, for any athlete, any age, this is what I would do before I let him get on the field. Cardiac blood profile at the office here. That's like a 360 degree look at your heart from a blood work standpoint. Then I do a heart scan, echocardiogram, to check everything, make sure the chambers are good, make sure all the coronary arteries are good, and make sure everything's flowing through the heart and the electrical current's working right. Supplements I would use. Cardio Plus for any athlete. I would use Cardio Plus for the heart muscle, the strength in the heart muscle. PDCM, which is all your minerals for muscle recovery after the event. Omega-3 EPA DHA to keep your blood sit, uh, slippery, to keep those essential fatty acids in there so the blood doesn't clot together. And last but not least, something that I like a lot, breath of life for the breathing. I can't tell you, there was a little boy, Zachary. This is how I found out about breath of life. Years ago, Zachary had asthma. His father would scream at him on the soccer field, claiming that or thinking that his son was lazy and just didn't want to assert himself. Well, he came in, the mom was resilient to come in, but we put him on Breath of Life. Within two weeks, he dropped all of his allergy shots and he started to run like a gazelle. He was having trouble breathing because of his exercise-induced asthma. But Breath of Life is a home run to help breathing, clean out the lungs. It even has an antiviral component to it, so it helps to save those lungs for any virus that might be in there. It's great for bronchitis, it's great for pneumonia, and it's great to help that athlete breathe, breathe better. Isn't this strange? <clears throat> Unknown causes are now the leading cause of death in Alberta, Canada. International Journal of Infectious Disease wrote this, revealed that the unknown causes are now the leading cause of death in Alberta, Canada at more than 3,262. Now, 223,000 excess deaths in America this year, September of 2022, so far. 
Other leading causes of death were chronic ischemic heart disease, delayed access to health care services, and post-COVID complications are also to blame. In 2019, there were only 522 unknown causes of death. In 2020, there were only 1,464 unknown causes of death. This is seen everywhere. You see in America what you see, the great mystery. Here it is. Many countries saw 18% excessive deaths during the pandemic. There should have been a drop in excessive deaths as we got COVID under control. More people who would have died this year from old age and natural causes died in the past two years from COVID. Therefore, this year's excess deaths should be below average. Excess deaths are at the 10 to 20% level in many countries, even as COVID deaths drop. Non-COVID excessive deaths will be more than COVID deaths this year. This excess death seems to be the primarily circulatory diabetes and cancer, but the reason for these extra deaths is unknown. Something doesn't smell right in the frying pan. My family business is casket manufacturing in North America. We re have received two bulk orders for sub five foot units child size in less than six months. Never in 30 plus years of business have we ever sold child size coffins in bulk. <clears throat> Big Pharma partnering with Chinese University linked to cyber attacks and espionage. Now forget the cyber attacks and espionage for now. My number one question is why partner with China on any healthcare issues or, or care solutions after the mess we've been through. In an order to expand its already ob obscene profit streams, Bristol Myers Squibb is partnering with Tsinghua University to develop new drugs for novel cancers and autoimmune. To read the force for the trees here, novel cancers and autoimmune is what scares me. Novel stands for new. Where's all this new stuff coming from? Many Ukraine labs that are U.S. run are also involved. I'll say that again too. Many Ukraine labs that are U.S. run. Remember we had that debate about Ukraine labs being U.S. run? There it is. What's causing these novel cancers and autoimmune diseases? That's what I want to know. So if I was to strengthen the body that has cancer, we don't treat cancer. If I'm going to strengthen the body that has cancer to make it more resistant to cancer, these are some of the things I want to use. Dysmuzine granules, vitamin D, that helps the immune system immensely. You remember the research articles on that years ago. Chlorophyll was, came out in 1954. Vitanox, cat's claw, uh, selenium methionine, the IAG, which is your large arabinoglactin, which is a well-researched product for prevention. And then, of course, liquid iodine. Strength, strengthen the body's resistance. That's what I would be doing. Here's a big one. Did the pandemic change our personalities? Did the pandemic change our personalities? The coronavirus pandemic has affected the entire globe and nearly every aspect of life. The, change, the changes were moderate by age, with younger adults showing disrupted maturity in the form of increased neuroticism and decreased agreeableness and consciousness and the older group of adults showing no statistically significant change in traits. From adults to youth, whenever you decrease socialization, you create hopelessness, which leads to depression. I'll read it again. For adults to youth, whenever you decrease socialization, you create hopelessness, which leads to depression, okay, which leads to depression. Suicides have quadrupled during the pandemic. Patients have told us, local police and funeral directors. Some of our patients are funeral directors say they've never seen so many suicides across the board. What is happening? Let's see if we can understand it a little bit more. This is a graph. Responsive nervous system to the pandemic. Here's the initial pandemic in its heightened state. Immediate threat of pandemic. Survival mode takes over. Then it drops, pandemic is over, and now getting back to the baseline function. That's what we're trying to do. When you're getting back to the baseline function, that's when everybody's struggling with the depression and everything else. 
So getting back to baseline, if I was going to try to get a patient back to baseline, these are some of the things I would consider. I would put the good fats back into the brain with the optimal EFAs. I would take care of some things of the, the depression with 5-HTP, L-Izyme, which is a rice extracted lithium, Minchex, and Cataplex B. These are some of the things that we can use to get the brain back to that level function. People are changing. Look at what's happening. Now hiring people that show up. People's whole mindset has changed over the years. The mental change of the pandemic. Isolation tested our sense of identity because it limited our access to in-person social feedback like I was talking about. This is a key point. The looking glass self explains how we developed our identity based on how we believe other people see us, but also try to influence their perception. So they see us in the way we would like them to see us. If we understand who we are based on social feedback, what happens to our sense of self-understanding under isolation? What happens? We lost it. Surprisingly, people with higher self-concept were more reactive, but also experienced a greater increase in negative effect. That means the wealthy guy would jump. UK doctors warn of new mental health pandemic following COVID lockdowns. Doctors are worrying that a number of people are left in the poor mental state since the lockdowns. It is estimated that 1.5 million children and teenagers will need new or additional support for their mental health over the next three to five years. In most cases, the patients are being referred to GPs who are not equipped to handle these many cases. Now, another thing I'd like to bring up, which is kind of an offshoot to this, is another problem I'd like to point out is the younger generation and the control or the children in control. That's something interesting I was telling my brother the other night. <clears throat> Kids in our gener or this generation that grew up with cell phones and all this high tech stuff, what happens in these situations is we're empowering these kids. Their adult parents, most of them, have not grown up with this stuff being in the schools and used every day. So these kids become advanced at using this technology. What happens is this, <clears throat> this has given the younger generation more power than the parents, causing a conflict of who's really in charge, causing possibly some of the disrespect for elders that we see today in kids. Because think about it, we all hand our kids the remote and say, show me how to work this thing. We all ask our kids to set up everything from YouTube to Netflix because they're great at it. They learn about it in school every day and they're fast. I've seen little kids less than five years old working on phones faster than I could. So we're empowering these kids, which I don't think is a good thing either. Studies show that people working from home due to the crisis are leading less healthy lives. The UK Institute of Employment studies show that people working from home are drinking more alcohol, eating less healthy food, and sleeping less. If you remember during that whole pandemic mess, they never shut down what? The party stores. One reason is because if you're an alcoholic and you all of a sudden go cold turkey on alcohol, you start to have seizures. But we also see this, all the people working from home did more alcohol, eating less healthy foods, and sleeping less. We see a lot of patients coming in daily now with all of that. They'll come in and say to us, oh my gosh, I drank way more during the pandemic. I ate crappy during the pandemic. I put on so much weight. This one during the pandemic had many people confused. The loss of smell. Remember that? Many people were like, I lost my smell in the long haulers. The reason some people failed to recover their sense of smell after COVID-19 is linked to the ongoing immune assault of the olfactory nerve cells. These findings also shed light on the possible underlying cause of other long haul symptoms, including generalized fatigue, shortness of breath, and brain fog. Scientists from Duke, Harvard, and the University of California, San Diego revealed that widespread infiltration of T cells engage in an inflammatory response in the nasal tissue where smell nerves are located. So there was your answer to one of my patients that said, why is everyone losing smell? Okay, 
Bill Gates, how to prevent the next pandemic. Is he trying to prevent or is he telling us something? Do you trust him is my question. <clears throat> this won't be our last pandemic that we face, Bill Gates. He said that to U.S. Chamber of Commerce. How could you possibly know this without knowing this is what I ask. Social media has become a vital tool. Online, even billionaires present themselves as human, authentic, and transparent. Transparent? Really? We took a hard look at the world of these rich philanthropists who dream of a genetically modified Africa. What we found? In places, their dream is already a reality. If you have enough money, you get to determine what the right path is for a set of countries as diverse as there are in Africa. Our foundation is uh, proud to be a part of that uh, with our $700 million commitment. They push philanthropic and humanitarian goals, but in reality, they're promoting something else entirely. They're funding high-risk research, a leap into the unknown. This is actually agricultural geopolitics. In our research, we came across the widespread idea that if you have a large personal fortune, you can save the world. A phenomenon that people were calling philanthrocapitalism. And it was an idea that you can essentially marry some of the ideas of corporate growth and corporate profit-making with the goals of philanthropy. And this is problematic. In reality, saving the world in the age of philanthrocapitalism is a profitable business. Geopolitics, they call it. I will look at energy, climate change, and disease eradication. One crucial term does not appear in Bill Gates' official literature. Philanthrocapitalism. And it was an idea that you can essentially marry some of the ideas of corporate growth and corporate profit making with the goals of philanthropy. And this is problematic because it's leading people to think that tech billionaires will somehow save us when actually they won't, they aren't, and some of their practices actually compound the very problems of environmental degradation. Bill Gates has taken on an urgent problem to eradicate the diseases that affect the African cassava. Why is Bill Gates the guy that's taking on the eradication of diseases? Shouldn't that be the job of a microbiologist, I ask you? I don't know if I trust that guy, but let's move on. Flu shots, zero change in death rates. When the flu shot was introduced in 1980, the claim was that it would put an end to the flu. Yet 40 years later, rates have not changed whatsoever. There's the facts on it. So if I was trying to create a viral treatment or to help somebody with virus in their body, these are some of the things I would think about. The SOD, superoxide dismutase and dismuzine granules, the lysine, grapefruit seed extract, immune plus has multiple things in it that are helpful for virus, vitamin D, which is a home run for helping the immune system, and Cyruta Plus. Those are just a few of the things that I would consider if I was trying to avoid all the viruses that are out there in the world because there's viruses everywhere. And viruses, what they like to do is they like to, they, their byproduct production is, a, is an enzyme called nogalase. And nogalase destroys a naturally occurring protein in the human body, which basically shuts down the ability to activate the macrophage cell, which is the strongest cell in the immune system. So basically, I'm going to try to prevent viruses as much as I would try to prevent cancer. I think viruses, I think parasites are some of our biggest problems in today's world. Now, moving forward, U.S. patent describes toxic mosquito, mosquito aerial. Toxic mosquito aerial release system patent outlines a system of spraying for biological, chemical, and other materials on manned aerial vehicles operable by remote control. Bill Gates concocted plans years ago for GMO mosquitoes that would fly around poisoning people with vaccines. Let's look deeper into this. This is not only in the U.S. 
Think it's only in the U.S.? Look at this. Think again. Researchers out of China are reporting their newfound ability to deliver re-engineered vaccines for animals. Mosquitoes fed a CYV Zika chimera virus were essentially transformed into vaccine carriers. These carriers, once unleashed, have the ability to inject their targets, including humans, with what research says is a vaccine against the chimera virus with a simple bite. So if we're trying to empower these mosquitoes to vaccinate animals, why is it also can hit the humans? <clears throat> Bill Gates was working on a malaria project and in injecting mosquitoes uh, with a weakened form of malaria. The scientists involved in that, in that study the GMO, uh, claimed that the GMO mosquitoes involved would not make people sick. One of the, par one of the, uh, one of the participants, Caroline Reed, tested positive for malaria. So I guess it doesn't get the humans, but one of their assistants or their participants in the study actually got malaria from that. Let's not stop at mosquitoes. One disease that the honeybees fight against is fowl broad, which is a USDA has now approved a license to create a vaccine for. Since a standard injectable vaccine is not practical for honeybees, scientists have created a formula that can be injected into royal jelly that worker bees feed to the queen. Once ingested by the queen, it is stored in her ovaries and can be passed down for generations. That's kind of a scary thought. Disease economy, how the United States economy runs on treating chronic disease. Now that can be true if you look at some of our U.S. senators and congressmen. They all own uh, stock in biotech companies, which are basically the pharmaceutical companies. It's profitable if people are sick. That's how they make money if they're invested in a pharmaceutical company. <clears throat> are the people claiming to be are the people claiming to fix our environment really destroying it? That's my question for you. No longer Texas sized trash islands in our oceans are now the size of Mexico and growing at an alarming rate. Fish that swim in plastic polluted waters end up accumulating those pollutants. In addition to worrying about heavy metals in fish, like mercury and tuna, now we must worry about increased plastic consumption. Perils of plastic, <clears throat> survey of risk to human health and the environment. We are surrounded by plastics every day from the food we eat to the water we drink to the products we use. Plastics are now present in our blood and urine in measurable amounts. The most common chemical found in plastics is DEHP, which is a chemical that helps to make plastic flexible. So unlike glass, it doesn't break. DEP is found in many medical devices, including IV bags and additives. Health risks due to micro and nanoplastic. Approximately 5 grams of plastic particles enter the human gastrointestinal tract per week. 5 grams of plastic now are ingested into your gastrointestinal tract. Once absorbed, these plastics are associated with the development of metabolic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and chronic liver disease. These micro and nanoplastics have the ability to change our gut microbiome. Over 25% rivers worldwide are contaminated and the overuse of antibiotic residue is in the water. Research obtained water samples from 250 rivers in 104 different countries across our continent and found that over 25% were contaminated with prescription drugs. The top being over-the-counter caffeine, nicotine, acetaminophen, beta blockers, anti-epileptic, uh, uh, antihistamine, antidepressants, gabapentin, lidocaine, metformin, and naproxen. Whatever the body does not absorb is passed through the urine and enters the sewage network. Moderate wastewater treatment uh, processes are affected, but do not completely remove all the traces. That's interesting. White House now pursuing same sun blocking geoengineering scheme that was called conspiracy theory two years ago. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has launched a five-year research plan that aims to, the develop, 
to develop methods of reflecting sunlight back into space in order to cool the planet and save it from global warming. The goal is to regulate the level of UV light we're exposed to on Earth. The thought is that if we can block enough, we can lower the temperature and will help prevent polar ice caps and flooding beachfront properties in the future. Basically what this is is chemtrails. That's how they're going to do it. <clears throat> chemtrails, what are they and how do they affect our health? Chemtrails are made up of numerous heavy metals including nanoparticles of aluminum, barium, strontium, and ethyl dibromide. So here's some of the things in chemtrails that we see. Aluminum, short-term memory loss, Alzheimer's, demyelination disease, ADD, ADHD, stress, kidney problems, autism, thyroid problems, bone problems, GI problems, sensitivity to heat and light. Barium, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, increased blood pressure, heart rhythm changes, irritation to the stomach, muscle weakness, changes to nerve reflexes, swelling of the brain, swelling of the liver, kidney disease and heart disease. Strontium, chronic kidney disease, bone disease, bone deformities, impaired bone growth, and bone tumors. Again, a great way to test for these, remember what I said, taking that porphyrzyme for three days in a high dose and then testing urine uh, to extract or see if you have heavy metals in your system. Uh, ethylene dibromide, poor breathing, rapid heart rate, low blood pressure, pulmonary congestion, edema, central nervous system depressant, loss of consciousness. I would definitely, in today's world, be thinking about doing a heavy metal test to see if you have heavy metals in your system. Running urine or running that saliva. Consider running a heavy metals test through hair or urine. Here they are. This is how we do the testing. These are two different tests. You'll see how we, we track it over here, where you're at. You can see this is above normal, above normal. That's your silver there, your titanium there. So that's how we test for it. Air pollution may shorten chromosomes in newborns. A study of chromosomes in newborn was conducted before and after a 2004 closure of a coal-burning power plant in China. Umbilical cord blood was analyzed in 255 newborns, half before the closing and half after the closing. Researchers found higher levels of PA H DNA cord adducts with <laughs> which is a toxic component of air pollution specifically from coal plants. In the future, half of all men will have a sperm count of zero by the year 2050. Experts are blaming low sperm count on lifestyle choices and chemicals in the environment. Low sperm counts don't just affect fertility, but also associate with an increased risk of di chronic disease, testicular cancer, and decreased lifespan. So, for the low sperm count, this is what I've used and got good results with people trying, you know, couples trying to get pregnant. Cytosine or kick, magnesium, and arginine complex. Those are the three I like for low sperm counts to bring up that sperm count for helping with fertility in young couples. The environmental impact of foods. Terrible, something's gone terribly wrong. Look at the men of yesterday and look at the men of today. Something went terribly wrong. So I ask you, is our world closing in on our health? I think by hearing some of the things that I said today, what we're going to be doing to create batteries and stuff, you can see that that's probably a yes. New Zealand, and hope, let's hope this doesn't come to America, New Zealand government to outlaw medicines that improve immune function. New Zealand's Labor Party introduced a new bill that restricts the use of herbal products that people use to treat infections and maintain a healthy lifestyle. They have compiled a list of over 300 natural products that hope to restrict, they hope to restrict and eliminate. Can you guess which ones these are, what, which ones they are trying to eliminate? That's right, they're all the antivirals. That's what they're trying to eliminate. So I think by everything I put out there, you can see the environment keeps closing in on our health. We're no longer in the days like I talked to a patient today 
We're no longer in the days where we have the farms that are organically farmed. For Pete's sakes, even at your local farm market now, if you ask the farmer, look into his eyes, do you, do you use glyphosate on your fields? Most, if they're honest, will say to you, everybody has to use that. That's Roundup. In Europe, we're finding Roundup in people's urine. We know that Roundup causes cancer and other things, but Roundup's being used on a regular basis all over the place, even at your farmer market's farms. I would ask them, we no longer see these farms where they're growing with the manure. We don't have the herbicide, fungicide, pesticides like we do today. We don't have the foods that we, we used to have that have healthy nutrition in them. They're devoid in a lot of nutrition. So we're seeing our health decline with the environment around us. So with that being said, I want to thank you for listening tonight to the lecture. Uh, I would hope that you would go out and support local. If you know somebody that has that organic farm, definitely use them. We've always, DHS has always tried to support our local businesses. And I appreciate you listening to this lecture tonight. Have a good night. Be safe and God bless.